Our scripture reading today is John 20:19 20, through 22. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands in his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Once again, thanks for joining us at Table Church today. And uh, today we're going to finish our series called Marks of a Movement. And this has been just really thrilling for me to preach through. I hope that you've learned a lot and been encouraged and inspired through it as well. But we've been praying and asking God, what would it look like for God to move mightily in our culture right here, right now, in this time, and in this place? And so we've been looking at some of the biblical and the historical precedents that often accompany a move of God in culture, or what we might call renewal or revival. And, and we've talked about how um, revival often begins during a time of cultural crisis uh, or upheaval, which certainly is something that we seem to be in right now. We discussed how God always calls his church to persistent prayer. We talked about how in a movement setting, there must be less pastor and more people that are involved in the ministry. Uh, we talked about how there has to be justice for all. We've discussed gospel transformation, that lives you'd never guess or just completely transformed by the gospel. Last week, we talked about how there needs to be Holy Spirit passion. And today's our final mark of a movement, and that is multiplying mission. Multiplying mission. Now, here's the bottom line of today's message. Movements multiply. Plain and simple. Movements multiply. That word multi multiply is important because notice I didn't say that movements grow and I didn't say movements add. I said movements multiply. You see, multiplication is different than addition because while addition means growth, and that's of course good, everyone likes growth, multiplication means exponential growth. And while addition might give us a bigger church, addition will not give us a movement. It's only when we cross the line into multiplication that a movement happens. Movements multiply. Now, it's a common illustration. You've probably heard it before. If you were to choose between receiving $10,000 a day for 30 days, or you could receive one penny a day, but doubling it every day for 30 days, which would you choose? If you chose to receive $10,000 a day for 30 days, by the end of the 30 days, you'd of course have $300,000. But if you chose to take a penny every day and double that, that amount every single day, by the day 30, you would have accumulated $21.5 million. See, multiplication beats addition every time. But here's the problem. Multiplication takes time. By the end of week one, your friend who chose $10,000 a day would be rolling up with $70,000, feeling pretty good, while you would have only made $1.27. In fact, your friend who chooses to take $10,000 a day is going to have more money than you every single day up until about day 24. It's not until the very end that your decision to multiply starts to take off. Multiplication takes time and determination. Adoniram Judson. Uh, is thought to be the first missionary from America. He traveled to Burma, and while he was in Burma, he did not see a single convert to Christianity for seven years. And then it took 13 years before there was enough believers for him to start a church. But by the last year of his ministry, he reports to being able to count 7,000 believers in Burma. And then just 10 years after he died, uh, research shows that there were 210,000 believers in Burma. That's, multipli that's multiplication, and it takes time. Sociologist Rodney Stark, he estimated that the end of the first century, there were only about 50,000 believers in the Roman Empire. Maybe 50,000 sounds like a lot, but in context of the entire Roman Empire, that ain't very many. However, most of these believers were disciple makers, which means that by the, by, by the time we get to 400 AD, so 300 years later, there was 37 million believers in the Roman Empire. That might be roughly half of the Roman Empire at the time. Now, if you were to say to me, Phil, you can have a congregation of a thousand spectators, or you can have a congregation of 10 disciple makers. I know what I would choose every time. I would choose the 10 disciple makers because multiplication beats addition every time. Now, at the end of our passage that we've heard today, 
uh, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, as the father has sent me, I am sending you. Now the key word in that sentence for, for us today is the word sent. The father sent me, I am sending you. Jesus is sent and we are sent, it says. And so as we close this series, I want to talk about what it means to be sent by Jesus. Because listen, kingdom multiplication only happens when we realize we are sent by Jesus. In the ancient world, when the king won a great battle, they would send messengers into the surrounding cities and these messengers would proclaim to the cities a special, a special message. And there's a term that they use for this message. And in the Greek language, it was the word euangelion. And when you translate that in the English, it's the word for good news or gospel. So these individuals, they would go into cities and they would proclaim the good news that Caesar, Augustus, or whoever it was had won a decisive victory. And that meant more power and wealth and peace and prosperity for Rome. You would say, good news, rejoice. Caesar has won the battle. And throughout the New Testament, this model is used to describe what Jesus does for God. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus kicks off his ministry with these words. He says, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That's the word, euangelion. Jesus is announcing good news. Just as an ancient evangelist for Caesar would ride into a town, come into a town, and he would start proclaiming the euangelion. Good news, Caesar has won the battle. His kingdom is advancing. So also, Jesus is declaring that God's kingdom is advancing. That's good news. But then Jesus turns it on us. He says, just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Now it's your job to go and to, and to proclaim the fact, the reality, the truth that God's kingdom is advancing. That people should repent and prepare themselves for that reality. But that's a remarkable statement, isn't it? That Jesus is sending us just as the Father sent Jesus, Jesus is sending us. What's so challenging about that is that the mission that Jesus was sent on wasn't just a part-time gig for him, was it? It wasn't just something he did on the weekends, right? It wasn't like he, Jesus had these life goals and ministry was just kind of an add-on that he did when he got around to it. Being sent for Jesus was not something you could opt in or out of. It was an entire, a whole life kind of vocation. His entire life was orient, oriented around the fact that he was sent by God. In fact, the Gospel of John alone describes Jesus as being sent over 40 times. And here's what we learn from that. God doesn't just send part of you. He sends all of you. We're not talking about a side hobby. We're not talking about a fleeting interest. A disciple of Jesus is sent. And being sent means that your whole life is oriented around the mission that you were sent on. Listen, we are sent by Jesus to fulfill God's mission. So today I want to describe three shifts that need to happen in our own hearts and in the church at large so that we can start living as kingdom multipliers, as people who are sent into the world. So number one, we must move from having a missions department in the church to being on mission. Okay, the church needs to move from having a missions department to all of us understanding that we are on mission. Now, I understand that not everybody hangs around churches as much as I do, right? Uh, but, but many churches have what we would call a missions department, okay? So this is part of the budget or the staff um, who's dedicated to things like international missions, maybe supporting missionaries or donating towards um, mission uh, nonprofits or NGOs or local nonprofits, that sort of thing. This is the missions department of a local church. And of course that model's not bad and this is what Table Church does to some degree, but I do think that it could be better because the danger is that we're training ourselves to think of mission as something that part of the church does. Okay? It's just one department of the church. Or, or something that, that only missionaries do. Missionaries do mission, right? But that's not the case. Like, like we start to think that um, everything else the church does, like worship or discipleship, or even administration and that sort of thing, that that's not mission. And I think that's wrong. Christians who know they're sent recognize that you can't divide mission up. It's a whole life, all-encompassing sort of thing, just like it was for Jesus. There's not a group of people over here who are missionaries and another group of people over here who aren't. There's just Christians who are either doing mission in their home country or in another country. Charles Spurgeon said, 
every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. When Jesus said that he sends his followers, he made a missionary out of all of us. We are all sent. And when we read on to the passage, we start to see just how serious Jesus was about, about the calling that he gave us. Here's what Jesus says. He says, and, uh, with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Look, this is one of those passages that kind of takes our breath away or kind of shocks us, right? With just how much confidence it puts in humanity. Jesus gives his followers the power to forgive sins. That seems kind of crazy. But think about this for a moment. When we think about forgiving sins, we often think of a priest. Now, what's a priest? A priest's job um, is to mediate forgiveness. So here Jesus is saying that his followers are all priests. Now, the Bible will talk elsewhere about this thing that we call the priesthood of all believers. Christians understand that we are all priests. Priests isn't just something a select few people do. So have you ever thought about yourself as a priest before? That might be a funny image because when we think of priests, we often think about, you know, dudes from the Old Testament whose job it was to like, you know, slaughter animals and sacrifice them. Or maybe you think about a Catholic priest, like in a black robe in a confessional booth. Like both of these images are things that are just kind of out of our orbit most of the time, I would imagine. And yet, the Bible says that we are priests. You can't escape it. The Bible says you're a priest. A priest's job is to mediate God's presence to the world. A priest is somebody who people go to when they've lost hope. Priests are the ones who run toward the broken and dark places of the world in order to bring light into it. That's what a priest does, and that's what we're called to do. That's what we all are. Missions is not part of what we do. It is what we do. Missionaries are not just people we send because God sends us all. We're all missionaries and we need to make that switch if we're going to have a mission that multiplies as a church. The second shift that needs to happen is this. We need to move in the church. We need to move from counting who comes in to counting who's sent out, right? And I don't want to say that we're never going to count attendance or anything like that, but what's our emphasis supposed to be? What what matters most as we try to gauge a metric of, of how our church is doing in, term, in terms of our mission? We need a fundamental shift in how we think about the church. And I want to illustrate using three different kinds of boats, okay? So first, some people see the church as a cruise liner. A cruise liner. According to this view, the church is there to meet my needs, right? The church should offer me Christian luxuries, for the whole family, perhaps, complete with entertainment and sports teams and free daycare and free swag and stuff like that. They come to the church asking things like, okay, how are the facilities? How's the music? Is the preacher's sermon entertaining? And are his jokes funny? And if the church ever stops making them happy, if they stop checking all the boxes, then they just jump to another cruise ship in a harbor that offers more programs or funnier sermons or whatever the case may be. And then, of course, there's the phenomenon where people who actually, there's people who actually attend different cruise ships at the same time, because maybe this church has good music, but this church has a better youth program, and that sort of thing. It happens all the time. It's all over the place. It's rampant today. So the cruise ship vision of the church is one option, but let me give you another option. Some people see the church as a battleship. Now, I believe this is better than the cruise ship version, because it doesn't necessarily form us into religious consumers all the time. Um... When you step onto a battleship, uh, you're there because you have a serious job to do. It's not an optional add-on at this point. You're engaging the enemy. The stakes are high. People who see the church as a battleship at least understand that the church is on mission. But there is a drawback to this one. The battleship view sees the church building as the primary place where the battle is waged. And perhaps people even, even think that, um, that their job is to pay the pastor to fight the battle while they sit there and watch. Obviously, that's an incomplete understanding as well. That's not the priesthood of all believers. Uh, so I think there's a third option. I think it's best to see the church as an aircraft carrier. Like battleships, aircraft carriers engage in battles, but in a different sort of way. See, aircraft carriers equip others to take the battle elsewhere. Notice this, aircraft carriers send. 
the carrier itself is there for refueling and for training. You don't want the battle to actually come to the aircraft carrier. You need to send missionaries out to take it elsewhere. The carrier is there for refueling and for training. It's not there to fight the battle. That's how churches should view themselves. This is a view of church that has multiplication at its heart. So when we're looking for a church, obviously you don't want the music or the sermon to be lousy. Obviously you want a place where children are going to be discipled into the faith well, and that's taken seriously and that sort of thing. You want a place that has good doctrine. All of these things matter, and I don't want to belittle them. However, I think that the most important question we can ask is this. How will this church equip me for mission? How will this church call me to selflessness, to be uncomfortably selfless in the way that it calls me to serve and to love and to represent Christ in the world? How will this church equip me for mission to go into the world and to be a priest? And I've never had anybody uh, who's checked out Table Church ask me, ask me that question. I would love if somebody would, uh, because I actually think we have a, a pretty good answer here at Table Church. Pastor Megan and I, we've spent countless hours trying to make material to, to put in your hands, to help you do this exact thing, to be a missionary in your context. We call it our discipleship pathway, and the idea behind it is that it will help you live your faith in real life. Just go to discipleship.guide to check it out. And uh, our vision is to see a movement of multiplying disciples across Des Moines. People who are disciples of Jesus, students of Jesus, learning how to live life in the way of Jesus, who are teaching others to do the same. And we have a goal um, that we set probably six months ago. Uh, boy, it was, it was a while ago. It was before the pandemic came along. We set a goal that by the end of August, we wanted to see 25 people at Table Church start to make a disciple. Uh, we're almost to 20 right now, and August isn't quite over yet. So folks, check out discipleship.guide. If you are making a disciple, you haven't told us, be sure you fill out the form at the beginning of the pathway so that we know. Uh, that way we can count you as we try to meet this goal. Because like I said, we need to shift from just counting uh, people that come in to people that are sent out. And this is one of the primary ways that we are sending people out to do ministry as priests, as missionaries in the world. So... Hop on to discipleship.guide and start asking God to show you who you can start discipling today. You see, someday when I reach the end of my ministry, the thing that will be most important to me is to be able to say that our church helped people live as missionaries in their everyday life. That's the passion that I have for ministry. My sermons can fall flat, my jokes can be completely ridiculous, but what matters most is that we equip people to follow Jesus and to help others do the same. Listen, the health of a church is best measured between Sundays. It's best measured between Sundays. It's best measured on how well people that come to the church see themselves as on mission during the week. That's why we must not only count who comes in, must, more importantly, we must count who comes out. That number of almost 20 people, hopefully 25 by the end of August, that matters. That's the most important metric for us. How many people are making disciples? And here's a third shift that needs to happen. We need to move from growing churches to multiplying churches. About 11 years ago, my wife Natalie and I helped plant a church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And we worked there for a decade, and the church grew very quickly. By the time that we left the church to come here to Des Moines to plant Table Church, there were four campuses. Uh, but there was one thing that we noticed, and it was that in those 10 years that we worked there, and this wasn't just Natalie and I, this was all of us on staff at the church, we, we looked back at the 10 years, and, and we noticed that the percentage of the city that didn't have a church had actually increased drastically in those 10 years. It went from around 30% of people who, who would say that they didn't have a church home to over 50% of people saying that they didn't have a church home. So all those years of ministry, of successful ministry, of vibrant ministry, of planting a new church, all that time spent, and we had actually lost ground in the community. And, and so we all looked at each other and we said, hey, we've been working so hard, but we've lost ground in culture. And it was in that moment that we realized, it clicked to, for us, we've been focusing on addition, not multiplication. And so that church, we went through a transition period of focusing our identity on something different, of changing our scorecard. We started a church planting training institute where we could train new church planters to go out and to start new works um, in other places. 
Rather than simply waiting for the harvest to come to us, we decided we want to send workers out into the harvest in a real and tangible way. And within just a couple of years, that training institute has sent out church planting teams to Des Moines, that would be us. Uh, they've sent them to Rock Rapids, to Boise, to Seattle, to Austin, Texas, and there's probably more in the works that I'm not even aware of right now. In 1771, a 26-year-old named Francis Asbury landed on American soil. Now, he was from England, and he was part of the Wesleyan movement. He came to bring the movement to America. Asbury raised up preachers that were called circuit riders. They would venture out on horseback into the frontier, bringing the gospel, planting new churches to places that, it, that the gospel hadn't reached yet. These pioneers took new ground for the kingdom in unreached places. Now, when Asbury arrived in America, there were only about 316 Methodists. That was the name of the movement. This was the Methodist movement that had its beginnings in John Wesley's uh, and George Whitfield's ministries. There was about 316 Methodists in all of America at the time. There were only about nine preachers. But by the time he died, there were more than 200,000 Methodists and over 4,000 preachers. That's the power of multiplication. Now, the church that you're attending today is part of that movement. Our mission is to bring the gospel to places that desperately need it. And for that movement to happen, we need to have multiplying mission. The first phase of multiplication is to make disciples because disciples don't have to be told to plant churches. Planting churches is simply what disciples will naturally do. In fact, I hope that within the next five years, we're having conversations about at Table Church about where we're going to plant our first church. I want to plant a church out of Table Church within the next five years. And in order to do that, we got to make disciples who understand their calling as missionaries. But here's something we got to understand about church planting. Uh, starting new churches can look many different ways. Table church is what you'd consider kind of a traditional church plant. You've got like an ordained pastor that preaches on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., okay? So that's kind of the traditional model of, of planting a church. But, but there is a movement right now uh, called Marketplace Multipliers. These are people who know that they're called to business or to medicine or to education. They're not called to go to seminary necessarily, uh, but they have a heart on fire for God. And they want to see new churches planted. So marketplace multipliers are planting churches in the workplace. These are the new circuit riders. There are churches meeting in break rooms, in high-rise uh, office buildings, in all sorts of other non-traditional ways. And they aren't necessarily led by ordained pastors. They're led by Marketplace multipliers, people with a heart on fire for God who say, you know what, I know that I'm a missionary. I'm going to go start a new work of God in this place because that's what disciples do. So folks, if we want to multiply, we don't have to be locked into what a church traditionally has to look like. That's exactly what John Wesley did. Back in his day, they didn't think people could preach outside, but then George Whitfield did it. John Wesley started doing it and a movement happened. We don't have to look the traditional way that a church does in order to bring the gospel to people that need to hear it. Remember this, if you build a church, you might get disciples, but if you make disciples, you'll always get the church. That's why Table Church focuses on making disciples. Because if we build a church and start programs and stuff like that, people may come, but that doesn't mean that they're disciples yet. But if you help people understand how to follow the way of Jesus, you will always get the church. So if, you, if you're interested in exploring what it might mean to be a marketplace multiplier, shoot me an email, phil at tablechurchdsm.org. Shoot me an email. I'd love to send you some resources and have a conversation about what that could look like. We want to equip you for that here at Table Church. So as we close out this series, here's what I hope has happened. Number one, I hope that a desperation to pray for our city has risen up in us. We've been praying every day for Des Moines. And um, it doesn't have to end now. We said we wanted to pray every day for Des Moines throughout this series. It doesn't have to stop today. Just go to tablechurchdsm.org slash pray, and you can continue to pray for Des Moines. But number two, I hope we've gained a new sense of gospel courage. A new sense of gospel courage. That God really does want to do something amazing here. And that if we just plant ourselves firmly in his gospel and in his love, that he'll use us to do it. So let's ask God to reveal the ways in our hearts that we've erred and that we've strayed, that we've grown cold. 
let's ask him to revive us first. If those things happen in your heart, I believe God will honor that and that something can happen here. Look, I've given my life over to seeing a movement happen here in Des Moines. If I get to the end of my life and, and we've simply created a space where religious people can come hang out, I'm not going to be happy about that. I want to see gospel transformation happen in hearts and lives. I want to see things that lead to kingdom multiplication, and it starts within each one of us here. So take a look inside your heart today. Do you have the inner knowledge that Christ died for your sins? Do you have a conviction that he rose in victory over sin and death? Do you have a hunger that, uh, for others to know him, to know the hope that comes from knowing Christ? Do you know that you are sent by Jesus? Do you see yourself as a missionary sent out into the mission field? Because there are a thousand ways that the government or other groups can, can meet other sorts of tangible needs in the world, but only we can bring the gospel, and the gospel is what is most needed in our culture by anybody. We need to make disciples. We need to plant churches. That's the mark of a movement. Pray with me. Well, God, I just ask for the kingdom vision and courage for us as a church to not rest, to not be comfortable with being a cruise ship or even being a battleship. Lord, make us an aircraft carrier. May we send, may we equip, may we send people out to be missionaries in whatever, con whatever context they're in, Lord. Would you, um, would you start something in our hearts today, Lord? Would you pur purify us? And then would you send us outward into the harvest, I pray. Start a movement, O God, we ask. And may it be here and now. In your name, amen.